Hi, good afternoon. Back here in studio on a Friday afternoon. We're going to talk some sports with Val. We've got a lot of stuff going on to talk about Val. Winter sports seasons are starting to wind down. Wrestling is done. The girls' basketball season for all of our girls' teams is done. The state finals are tomorrow. Swimming state finals are tomorrow. So, I mean, we're getting down to it. We had our boys' sectional draw last Sunday. So, it's winding down quickly here for the winter season. You know, Steve, we've talked about the Val Jinx for how long now? A while. Well, I just wanted to say um, I drove through Fort Branch, Indiana last Friday night. Okay. Last, or last Friday afternoon. What high school is located in Fort Branch, Indiana? That would be Gibson Southern. Who made the state finals Saturday in girls basketball in Class 3A? That would be Gibson Southern. So I just want to say it's no longer a Val Jinx. It is the Val Blessing. Okay. If I come to your town, you are going to the state finals. You're going to the state finals. I'll be, ta I'll be, taking, I'll be taking bids for my services <laughs> this coming too, week. Too bad they weren't there at the time, right? Yeah, too bad they weren't there. They, they were at the semi-state. Yeah. But, all right. I, I didn't, uh, didn't know where you were going with that, so that was interesting. Yes. So, um, apparently, uh, you didn't drive past Caston High School on the way there then. I didn't. Drive, I did not drive past no, Gaston. That's true. Okay. So uh, let's get into it. Here is, uh, like I said, we're winding down our fall season or our winter seasons. Our fall seasons are done. Uh, we are winding down our winter seasons. And Val, you were down in Evansville last Friday and Saturday. Um, why was Val in Evansville? Well, the wrestling state finals meet was down in Evansville this year due to the. Uh, Fieldhouse being a, a little busy. They mm -hmm. had the uh, NBA All-Star Game at uh, Gainbridge Fieldhouse over the weekend, last weekend. So they moved the Wrestling State Finals down to the Ford Center in Evansville. So tell us about uh, the action down there. Five Rochester Zebras in action. Right. Five Rochester, five Rochester wrestlers made state, and two of them were state placers. They were the Beck brothers. Uh, Brant Beck wound up finishing third at 165, and Brady Beck wound up finishing fifth at heavyweight. Um... Brant Beck becomes just the fourth Rochester wrestler ever, we believe, to have finished in the top three in his weight class in Rochester history, uh, the other three being Damon Hummel, Corey Fornell, and Marshall Fishback. And as for Brady Beck, he finishes uh, in fifth, we mentioned fifth place, three-time state placer. He's the second Rochester wrestler ever to be a three-time state placer. Damon Hummel's the other. Damon graduated 30 years ago. Damon went second, second, third, sophomore, junior, senior. Brady goes uh, sixth, seventh, fifth. Mm -hmm. But still, to make it to Saturday, three straight years at the state finals, is it puts Brady among the goats, yeah, among the greatest of all time in Rochester history. Well, any any time you're doing something and the only other person to have done it in Rochester history is Damon Hummel, yeah, you know you're in, you know. High company. Right. Uh, put it this way. He wrestled 12 matches at the state finals in his career, and he went 7-5 and five in those 12 matches uh, when you're facing the best of the best. Right. Uh, the, you know, the, it just speaks well. It speaks so highly of Brady. He finished with 164. I mean, if you get to 100 career wins, you have had a heck of a career. Mm -hmm. Brady finished with 164, which is just <laughs> mind-boggling. Just a shade over 100. Yeah. <laughs> Alex wow. Deming, by the way, got to 150. Yeah, but 164 wins. The, he is the top on the top of the mountain for that, for in terms of total wins. Uh, a four-time regional champion. Uh, it was just came down to, and again, for Brady, you were just heartbroken for him because he lost. You know, he went three and one at the state finals. Went up finishing in fifth. He lost to Nate Johnson of Center Grove two to one in overtime in the quarterfinals on Saturday morning. Nate and Johnson wound up winning the state championship. I was say, what did Nate Johnson end up doing? Yeah. And again, it came down to overtime. Brady just could not get an escape. But it, again, just heartbroken for him because because it just came down to that. And you know, just asked him. I asked him about that, and I asked Clint Gard about it, and both kind of agreed it just came down to nerves. Just under the bright lights, that happens even to the best of wrestlers. It happens because mm -hmm. Brady has been. You know, dominant throughout his career, and has been especially dominant from the bottom position. Just couldn't get that escape when he really needed it. And uh, again, uh, just 
this close because you'd have to you'd have a feeling he would have been if he had he won he would have faced Anthony Popey of Plymouth in the semis and of course he, he's already beaten Popey three times and then if he beats Popey that gets him to the finals and who knows but yeah just kind of uh, you know one of right. those things you, you you don't put him you know Popey was fourth he was fifth. Popey's not a better wrestler than him. It just happened to be the the way that draw went, right. how he had to wrestle, who he had to wrestle at what times. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, just one loss, but uh, it dropped him down into the the fifth place match. But what a what an amazing career! And uh, you know, I I don't know what his plans are going forward. But I, if he's not wrestling collegiately, I I do know what his plans are. Okay. He's not going to college. He okay. does not want to go to college. He okay. is going to get into a trade. He wants to learn the HVAC trade. Okay. And he plans to he wants to open his HVAC an HVAC business someday. Okay. That's uh that's well must much needed. I mean to get some young people in the trades. I obviously uh, I, I worked with contractors for a long long time mm-hmm. in my previous job and that's the thing they're lacking <laughs> is mm-hmm. youth. Mm-hmm. I mean there's a lot of you know, guys that are retiring but still working because they can and they're needed. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's a an HVAC is a it's a good business right. to be in. And I believe I believe Brady was an academic all state team for wrestling. So I mean, he's it's he's not he's not choosing not to go to college because his grades aren't good enough. Yeah. It's, he wants Smart to get into kid. the trade. Yeah. 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 And I think anybody who's met Brady knows that he's a very smart kid. I yeah. Mean, well, he's a hard worker too, mm-hmm. and that's that's going to be uh, you know a big thing for him moving forward. So, uh, you know, we talked about Brant and Brady. Talk about the uh, the other three that were down there at uh, Evansville for the uh, zebras. Right. Um, uh, Grant Holloway lost to Delta's Jensen Boyd in the first round. He lost in a technical fall. Jensen Boyd was just a really good uh, wrestler. He wound up finishing in a fourth. Uh, Grant, he knows he's going to get bigger and stronger. I mean, mm-hmm. Boyd looked. Just had broader shoulders, just looked, uh, just looked like a bigger kid. So uh, again, Grant was he was right. I mean, again, it was a pretty close match. It was four to one after the first period, and then Boyd just kind of picked up the pace. It was just take down, get him up, take down, get him up. Mm-hmm. And before you knew it, it was a technical fall, and Boyd won twenty three to eight. Well, still just a freshman. Yeah, I mean he'll be back. You know, make it down to state your freshman year. That's that's a big accomplishment. That's another one of those things that not a lot of people have done. Right, and again, he had knee surgery back in December. So mm-hmm. again, there's no question in Grant Holloway's toughness. It's just he, but it did that the surgery did take away a little bit of mad experience for him. But again, he, if you look at his eight, his seven losses. I mean, he lost three times to Alonzo Shantia of Plymouth, who made state. To Mason Jones of Lake Central, who was third in the state, to Boyd, who was f- fourth in the state. I mean, if you t- if you beat Grant Holloway, you were probably really really good. Yeah. So he he's got a very bright future. Uh, at uh, 126, Lane Horn lost to Cody Rolls of Jay County nine to five, a heartbreaking loss. I think if you, if you read what Clint Gard wrote on Facebook, you said Lane's loss made him physically sick. Hmm. And it was that was a, it was a hard match to watch because Lane has been so good and he was a five to two, and Rolls was just very good in from the bottom position of getting escapes, and you know um, I talked with Lane afterwards and you know Lane said that Rolls got him in a headlock and he kind of he kind of wasn't the same after that and uh, was able to get and then got a near fall. He got a, a reversal and a near fall. It went from 5-2 to 7-5, and all of a sudden Rolls was ahead, and Lane had to make something happen, and he, he couldn't do it. And um, it, 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 was a, it was a shocker of a loss, but, again, um, that's the state finals for you. I mean, everybody is good. Everybody is mm-hmm. capable of doing something. Everybody, you know, some some guys are good matchups and some guys are not, and Rolls is a senior. Lane's a sophomore, and he really kind of used his experience and was kind of a crafty kid and was smart enough to get out of some tough spots and wound up winning the match. Yeah. And then Alex Debbing at two fifteen lost to Jackson Weingart of uh Indianapolis Cathedral three to two in the first round on Friday night. Uh it was uh two to two late in the second period. To start the third period, Weingart had the choice. He chose bottom. 
Alex chooses then can choose neutral, but then it means he gives up a one point penalty to Weingart. So Weingart goes up three to two, but now they're on their feet, and that's where Alex thinks he has the advantage because he doesn't he doesn't want to be trying to ride waste a lot of time trying to ride Weingart. So he gives him the escape basically to start the period, betting he can get a takedown. But good defense by Weingart that entire third period, and he got the win three to two. Yeah, as Alex was just not able to get that takedown, and just again a a heartbreaker of a loss for Alex because when has Alex not been able to get the takedown when, yeah. when he seemingly has yeah. needed it? What a, what an outstanding career for Alex Deming as well. One hundred and fifty wins. Yeah, that's that's you know like you said, a hundred is a, is a great number. And you got two seniors graduating with over 150 wins for the yeah. Rochester Zebras, and you know it's just uh, a testament to what Coach Gard and, and his coaching staff, and you know just the the work that they've put in. I know Alex started wrestling what third grade. Yeah, age eight. Yeah, it was. There's a funny story. He second grade. Yeah, probably. He, yeah, he went to play. There's a funny story. He, I, I hope I can tell this. He went to play. He, he started. <laughs> well, you to play. are so. His dad took him to basketball over at Caston. Mm-hmm. And apparently, the guy running the league, when Paul came to pick him up, Alex's father came to pick him up. He goes, uh, "Your son is roughhousing everybody. Basketball's not, and he's fouling everybody really hard." <laughs> he goes, "Basketball is a game of skill and finesse." And so <laughs> your son needs to really tone down his – and stop roughhousing everybody. He's really frightening the other kids. <laughs> and the next kid, the next week he took him to Clint Guard's wrestling camp. And Alex comes back from the first day. He goes, Dad, Dad, I do, everything pl- I do everything in wrestling that I do playing basketball. And in wrestling I'm encouraged. Yeah. They loved it. They loved it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's a, and it's he, a pretty good sign that and wrestling, wrestling is a sport for him. Wrestling is a sport for you at that point. Yeah. yeah. So the great stuff there. You know, three of the five qualifiers will be back. There are only, you know, a freshman yeah. and two sophomores. So, I mean, just uh, a great future uh, still ahead for a lot of these. And there's yeah. some Rochester Zebras coming up as well. Right. You should mention Alex Deming uh, wants to be a Green Beret mm-hmm. in the U.S. Army. Yeah. He's had a lot of um, family members go into the Army. I mean, and obviously Green Beret is the top of the top. Yeah. Yeah. He's talking about special forces in the army. In fact, he was he has a college visit planned to the Citadel, which is in Charleston, South Carolina. It's a military school. So, mm-hmm. well, again, uh, yeah, best of luck to Alex. I, yeah. if he wants to do it, I'm sure he'll he'll do it because mm-hmm. he is definitely one of those kids. It seems like you know if he puts his mind to it, he's he's going to get it done. Yeah. So. But as for those coming back, I mean, you'll have three state qualifiers coming back. Um, plus, uh, you know, Declan Guard is going to be back. Uh, he was a semi-state qualifier. Wyatt Davis, we presume, is going to be back. He's a semi-state qualifier. Um, yeah, I mean, just, you know, again, the future is bright. We'll see, again, and, and really the the, the the feeder system, you know, is really, yeah. uh, and, you know, middle school wrestling just started this past week. I mean, the season just is kind of nonstop, you know, uh, through, you know, March. So, yeah, yeah again, uh and, and there are just so many kids who want to wrestle. And, again, the the, co- the coaching staff is kind of spread out in all areas. You know, I know Bryce mm. Roberts is working with the middle school kids. Um, but, yeah, it's it's definitely a, 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 the program is just continue to expand and expand. And it looks like we'll have a IHSA-sanctioned girls wrestling next year, hopefully. I mean, that's the hope, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, uh, I think, and, and right, again, the Rochester kids, the, the Rochester girls followed the boys – all the way down. I mean, they mm-hmm. were there. They were m- many of them traveled all the way down to Evansville over the weekend. So yeah, yeah. to follow them, they I know many most of them were in East Chicago for the semi states. So yeah, again, the the the, the girls program is only going to continue to blossom as well. Yeah, and then hopefully uh, we'll see a lot of those uh, faces back down at uh, Gainbridge. A little bit shorter drive next year for the the state championship. So yeah, yeah. Again, the people from Evansville were super nice, especially in the you know the media. The media area, they were just super great to us, and they allowed us to listen to the cast and game in yeah. the media room. Uh, they were super nice. But, uh, uh, yeah, and again, I, I would say the attendance was, again, it was pretty full by by the time of Saturday night for the finals. Yeah. I mean, it, Fort Center seats about 11,000. It looked about pretty close to full. Wow. 
for Saturday night. Uh, obviously, if you're Evansville Modern Day, they were the ones who got the most, yeah, got the most cheers. Yeah. I mean, they were. They had, I think they had four kids, but boy, they're. Those fans were out in full force. The other girl, the other person, who, the other wrestler who was got the most applause was Juliana Ocampo of New Haven, yeah. who finished sixth at 106. She became the first girl to ever win to win a match at the state finals. Yeah, there first been girls placer. Who, there have been girls who have made it before, but she's the first placer ever finished sixth at 106. She pinned Alonzo Chantia of Plymouth in the first round on Friday night. Hmm. She was down nine to one in that match, came back to lead ten to nine, and then pinned him. Wow! With about 15 seconds to go, wow. and the crowd went crazy. That might that was. His, one of the loudest ovations all weekend. Yeah. Well, good stuff down there. I'm sure everybody appreciates uh, the coverage that you were able to uh, provide and catch out the uh, the stories. I know there's uh, there were several preview stories that you wrote on the blog as well as, uh, you know, several of, uh, you know, post-wrap-up stories as yeah, well. Yeah, I, I wrote a story on Friday night after the first day, and then I wrote two more stories after it was over, one about the Beck brothers and then the rest about the rest of the Rochester kids Yeah, and some few more uh, odds and ends rtc4sports.com or you can go to our website rtc4.com and click on the Val Sports blog mm-hmm. for that. So. And I want to thank Paul Deming so much for his photos. I mean, my goodness. All year long. All year long. Yeah, he's just great. Uh, you know, so willing to share the photos and, you know, any kind of information that you need. He's yeah. always been there and been willing to uh, to share. So we appreciate that. Right. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Uh, again, it's it, it really is a, a group a group thing. Mm-hmm. All right, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about the uh, swimmers. Is uh, We've got a couple swimmers in our area that we're going to talk about going down to the IU uh, Indianapolis. I guess it's not IUPUI anymore, is it? It's IU Indianapolis? They just call it the, they call it the IU Natatorium. I guess it's, uh, I think, yeah, it's IU Indianapolis. It'll be IU Indianapolis next year, or yeah, I think it's still yeah. IUPUI until next year. Or... Okay. So, uh, anyway, we'll have some uh, wrestlers, or wrestlers, swimmers, That'll be swimming at state coming up uh, tonight and tomorrow. So we'll talk about that when we get back. When it comes to legal needs, you want to make sure that you have the best team in your corner. Here at Peterson, Wagoner, and Perkins, we strive to provide you with the highest quality legal and professional service. Whatever your needs are, from estate planning and trusts to appeals and guardianships, Peterson, Wagoner, and Perkins has the knowledge and experience to serve you now and in the future. Stop on by to In Your Hardware for all your home project needs. With a broad selection of garden supplies, tools, and paints featuring brands like Milwaukee, Diablo, and their newest paint line Valspar, you can be sure that Inyards will supply you with the most top rated equipment. And if you need something for a quick job, check out Inyards Rental Selection to get you going. Stop on in at 1619 Main Street, Rochester, or call 574 223 4920 to see how Inyards friendly staff can help you. Pace Setters Real Estate knows that buying and selling properties can be a tough and complicated task. That's why we are here to provide you with our full service process where we walk with you every step of the way. Whether you're looking to buy a home or you're looking to sell, Pace Setters Real Estate is here for you. Call 574 223 5000 or visit us online at www.pacesettersre.net. At First Federal Savings Bank, you can bank on the go. With the First Federal Savings Bank mobile app, you can check account balances, transfer money, view account history, deposit your checks, and pay your bills. If you want your mobile banking done easy, download the First Federal Savings Bank mobile app today. The app is available for both Apple and Android phones and tablets. Just type in First Federal Savings Bank in the search bar and look for the white star with the green background. Hi, welcome back. Talking sports with Val here on a Friday afternoon, and we've got uh, we've got some swimmers that had some pretty good success in the pool there at Warsaw. And, you know, Val, one of the uh, stories that you wrote was concerning the Tippecanoe Valley swimmers. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're pretty familiar with the Warsaw pool this year. They've uh, actually had to uh, practice at Warsaw because of the construction that's going on there at Valley. And so, uh, you know, not a convenient time to practice as they were going there around 7 o'clock every night and practicing right. for a couple hours. But, um, boy, they did really well in the pool. And then we got one from Rochester, Jake Seifer, who, uh, you know, the longest race they have, the 500-yard, he's uh, he's going to be going to state too. Right. Uh, 
as for Jake Seifer, in a lot of ways, he, I mean, he had to basically climb the step ladder. He was fourth in the 500 free at sectional as a freshman, third as a sophomore, second as a junior, and finally as a senior. He wins, and he finally is going to state for the first time. Who did he finish second to as a junior? Isaac Whetstone from Valley. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jake and Isaac are very good friends. I mean, they when uh, Isaac first started swimming, he started with the Rochester Royals, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. And Isaac's a junior. Jake's a senior. So Jake's a year older. Isaac always looked up to Jake, always look, looked at him as, called him his big brother. Mm-hmm. And so they... They get to girls' sectionals, and, of course, usually the boys go cheer for the girls and the girls cheer for the boys. So it's a girls' sectional. This is two weeks ago. And Isaac tells Jake, uh, I'm not doing the 500 free this year. We're, uh, I know we're, we're, I just, we're, we're practicing at Warsaw uh, the way, with our practice schedule. I, need an extra, I basically need an extra practice, but I can't, get that, I can't get that extra time in the pool because Warsaw needs the pool. To have their practice, I I can't. I'm doing the 100 and the 200 this year, hmm. so do do what you want to do with that. And Jake goes, okay, because hmm. Jake was thinking. Jake was thinking, I'm not going to do the 500 free anymore because I'm worried that Isaac's going to do it. and I want to get to state somehow, and if Isaac's going to do the 500 free, then I need to pick a couple other events. Okay. Now all of a sudden, Jake's thinking is turned around. Yeah. And he's thinking, okay, now I'm going to do the 500 free. Right. And so he enters the 500 free and he wins it. Nice. And yeah. he's going to state for the first time. Um, he won it handily. He he was the number one qualifier. He beat the second place swimmer from Columbia City by over 10 seconds. So, mm-hmm. and he swam a 459 as well. And Jake said he'd been dealing some tendonitis in his elbow, and uh, overcame it. Yeah. So he, you know, and it was interesting because Jake told me that um, he. He was worried about the tendonitis. He, he thought, "Oh, I'm not going to break five minutes." And he, he touches the wall. He looks up four fifty nine point four nine, so a personal best at the sectional as well. Yeah. So what's his uh, schedule look like then for this weekend? He'll swim uh, tonight in the heats. He is seated thirtieth, and of course the top sixteen times advance. So uh, Jake's pretty, pretty realistic about his chances yeah he goes if i finish 29th that means i'll have beaten somebody i wasn't supposed to beat yeah that would be that would be a pretty good performance so but, you, you said his time was 459 49 what kind of time would he you know realistically have to get to to ish to get in that 16 445 yeah somewhere in there. so that's that's a big drop Four, may, yeah. i mean maybe or some, maybe somewhere somewhere in the 440s at least yeah yeah so ten ten plus seconds he'd have to cut off of his personal best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was interesting. Jake, who swam the five hundred free many many times in his career, goes, "You have to be a crazy person to swim the five hundred freestyle." Yeah, and he I goes, agree. <laughs> and he, he goes, just because you've done it a few times doesn't be, mean it comes easy after a while. It mm-hmm. never becomes. It's never easy. Mm-hmm. And it was funny. I asked Isaac Whetstone the same question. He goes, "Yeah, you got to be crazy to swim the five hundred freestyle." <laughs> But and and if you read the article that I wrote about uh, about Jake and I and I asked Jake and we got to, we got to talking about baseball as well because mm-hmm. as many of you know Jake's going to play baseball at IU Kokomo and he said we talked about muscle memory because when you swim that first two hundred it's like that's hard enough and then you got three hundred meters to go or three hundred yards to go mm-hmm. and he's like. Yeah, you get through that next 200 on muscle memory because your brain's telling you stop, rest. This is not fun. <laughs> yeah. Stop. Yeah. But he goes, and he goes, it's the same thing when it comes to hitting. He goes, an 85 mile an hour fastball. He goes, you don't see the ball hit the bat. You know, you just, or if it's a curveball, you just know how to to throw your wrist at the ball, and it's just it's some it's just something you've done over and over again. Yeah. So it's that. It was, so yeah, it was it was interesting talking about the idea of muscle memory with him. Yeah. So beyond just Jake, we talked about Isaac. Uh, you know, oh, Valley I, had some really successful swimmers. I, at Valley had an unbelievable. Yeah, you know, they finished in third place, but don't don't look at that. I'm, again, they've got basically six guys on the whole team. Uh, Isaac Whetstone set school records in both the 100 free and the 200 free, and then he broke his own record in the 100 free. Again, if you if you do the first leg of the 400 free relay, that can count toward a school record. Okay. Because it starts with a starting block, starting gun, 
and you touch the wall and they measure the split. So that does count. Hmm. Only the first leg of the 400 mm-hmm. free. Yeah. So he swims 47.01 to win the open 100 free. Then he swims 46.87 a few minutes a few, a few minutes later in the first leg of the the relay. Mm-hmm. So what a performance. And then on top of that, he goes 143 in the 200 freestyle. That is crazy fast. So in essence, he had one of the shortest-lived records in the, yeah, <laughs> the pool at Valley. Yeah, which he broke. And um, guess what events his dad made state in back in 1997? Huh? Scott, the 100 free and the 200 free. Yeah. So isn't that an awesome story? Yeah. Uh, Scott Whetstone was one of the great swimmers in, ba- in Valley history. Uh, and then, uh, you know, Marcus Smith going to state for the third straight year in the 200 IM, going to state for the second straight year in the 100 backstroke, swims 51.25. He's I think seated 12th, so he is actually favored to make it to Saturday in the backstroke. Um, he said he'd been dealing with some illness earlier in the year. He said, yeah. he said he wasn't sure if he had mono or not, but he battled back from that uh, 51.25, an incredible time. Uh, and then uh, broke the school record in that event, broke his own school record. Uh, he thinks he can go, he swam 201 in the 200 IM. He thinks he can get down in the, in the one, mid 150s. Um, so we'll see how he does there. Uh, and then uh, Carson Parker, he had ne- never made state in an individual event before. He made it as part of a relay before, but never in an individual in, in an individual event. And now he makes it twice. He wins the 100 breaststroke in 59.13. Not a school record because the school record was the record he broke at the prelims, 58.83 two days earlier. Mm-hmm. So he's got that record. And then the he broke the school record in the 50 freestyle, 21.69. He didn't win the race. Logan, Sport Jake, Logan Sports' Jake Fincher mm-hmm. won in 21.55, but he made the state on a callback because mm-hmm. you have to have 32 swimmers in each event to fill out the fill out basically the whole grid. Yeah. And so he got a callback in that event, so he's made it, in, made it to state back in both events. And if you don't, if you don't know, this is a little side. If you don't know who Jake Fincher is from Logan Sport, he has broken seven Logan Sport records this year in swimming. Right, basically, he owns he's the had, entire Logan Sport record. Yeah, book. he's had a decent year. Yeah, yeah. And then Valley also breaks the school record in both of the relays: the 200 medley relay and the 400 free relay. 136.99 in the 200 medley relay, and that's with Tucker Whetstone. That's why I also wrote a little about Tucker Whetstone, Isaac's younger brother. Isaac's a junior. Tucker's a freshman. Tucker swims that anchor leg in the in the 200 medley relay. Swims the freestyle leg, and then Tucker also swims the second leg in the 400 free relay. So he's had to come on this year and, and fill out those relays because remember they graduated Carl Parker from last year, and that was kind of the worry like who's going to step up and mm-hmm. do this? Well, it was Tucker Whetstone. So yeah. mentioned him. They swam 314 in the 400 free relay. That is moving. That mm-hmm. is cutting through the water fast. Mm-hmm. Just to put 314 into perspective, the Rochester school record is 318. Mm-hmm. Wow. And I think they said that it might have been a sectional record. In a war, and, and I think it might, might even approach the Warsaw Pool record, yeah. 314. Wow. Because remember, if everybody swims a 50 or swims their leg in 50 seconds, mm-hmm. that's 320. Mm-hmm. They went 314. <laughs> yeah. Do the math, right? Yeah. I mean, that is crazy fast. and. Mm. I think they're going to be favored to make it to tomorrow in the medley, in the uh, freestyle relay, maybe in the medley relay as well. Yeah. So both relays have been trem- are tremendous. Uh, they they made it in two of the relays each of the last three years, and again that goes back to Marcus and, and Isaac and Carson. Yeah. So uh, everybody will be. What time does that start? Everybody will start swimming tonight. They tonight have to go through tonight at six. Six. When the prelim okay. starts. So basically four heats of eight in each event. Mm-hmm. And then again, the top sixteen make it back to tomorrow to, se- to tomorrow to Saturday. Yeah. And again, there's a constellation race; those who finish ninth through sixteenth, mm-hmm. and then the top eight compete for the state championship. Yeah. Again, Carmel's the favorite because they basically get three kids in each event. So. Yeah. And I think two of their relays qualified first, and the other qualified second. So. <laughs> again, Carmel's in kind of another stratosphere, but. Yeah. Again, what Valley's done has just been tremendous. I mean, yes, Warsaw won the sectional, but they only won. One event, they only won diving, hmm. which is interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. But they win the they win the sectional. But they had three of the top four divers, and Bally yeah. had only one diver finished seventh. So yeah, yeah, they 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 pile on the points there, and Bally doesn't even have a two hundred free relay team. So again, those, those are points that 
uh, Warsaw kind of laps up on the field, yeah. literally. Yeah. Along with Culver Academy, he was second. Yeah. Good luck to all the swimmers yeah. as they uh, compete for state starting tonight. I want to give a shout out to Wes Steininger. He was seventh in the 100 butterfly and eighth in the 200 IM. Okay. So a great career for Wes when it yeah. comes to it. But he made the finals in both of his events. Yeah. Yeah. He'll be uh, he'll be busy coming up here shortly on the track. So. Yeah. And, you know, Wes is just such a team player. I, get, I go to Rochester practice the other day. I, th- I think Jake's going to be the only guy there. No, Wes is swimming laps with Jake trying to push him. Yeah. Good. Because that's just what, how Wes is. That's, Re- yeah. Reese Johnson was there too. Yeah. Just the yeah. way those guys are. Yeah. I'm sure he wasn't swimming the full 500 with him. No, no. <laughs> Here, I'll do I'll do 100, you do 100. Yeah, yeah. no. So, All right, let's take another quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the uh, cast and lady comets at the uh, semi-state down in Frankfurt last Saturday. We'll be back here in just a minute. Kriskin's Pools and Spas is your local contractor for all your pool and hot tub installation needs. With a wide selection to choose from, Kriskin's is sure to hook you up with exactly what you need no matter what your budget is. To learn more about our services, visit Kriskin'sPoolsAndSpas.com, call 574-857-3100, or stop on by at 7448 Liberty Avenue in Fulton to see how Kriskin's can help you. Here we go, Billy. Swing hard. As your local agent, I know you. I know every Saturday, your son Billy plays Little League. We sponsor his team. And we know you love parking way too close to the field. That's why we tailor a unique policy for you and your car. Because sometimes, something from out of left field can literally come from out of left field. That's simple human sense. Ask the Jennings Insurance Agency in Argus and Rochester if auto owners make sense for you. Looking for an easy way to provide custom branded products for your business, school, sports team, or fundraising event? Let the Winning Edge set up a customized web store that features branded products tailored to your business, school, church, or charitable cause. With a wide variety of customizable apparel, sports accessories, office accessories, and custom tumblers, the Winning Edge is sure to provide you with the best style that suits you. Find your edge by calling 574-223-6090 or going to our website, thewinningedgeathletics.com, and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Hello, sir. How can I help you today? I'm looking for a special gift. We have no tolerance for tomfoolery today. What do you mean, tomfoolery? What I said was, we have a nice selection of jewelry today. May I suggest that you give my friends at Affordable Hearing a call? Affordable Hearing offers hearing testing and unique solutions for everybody. We guarantee the lowest prices in the area and now have offices in Rochester and Logansport to serve you better. Call to book an appointment today. Welcome back here, talking sports with Val and uh, the Caston Comets season. Unfortunately, came to an end on Saturday in the semifinal round of the semi-state down at Frankfurt to Marquette Catholic. Forty-one uh, thirty-four was the final score. Caston finishes their season with a twenty-two and four record. Val, we talked about that Marquette team. We talked about the youth of that team. Would they get rattled in a big spot like that? And boy, they did not. They did not. If any, if anything, it was Caston who got rattled. Hmm. Caston committed 19 turnovers in that game, and free throws were huge. Caston was four for 12, and Marquette Catholic was nine for 10. Mm-hmm. And the best player on the floor, we hate to, I mean, it was Lanaya Davis. It yeah. was not a Caston player. Sophomore. 20, 26 points out of their 41. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of teams who struggled to score 26 points against Caston this year. Oh yeah. She scored 26 by herself. Yeah. I think they really, they really kind of hemmed in uh, uh, Marissa Pleasant. Mm-hmm. She did not have a big game, really. Uh, uh, the Chabes girl, uh, am I pronouncing that name? Chabes, I think, Chabis. is what they were saying on the radio. Yeah, I mean, yeah. She was nice, but boy, it was their, it was their length that really caused Cast and problems, and Cast and just couldn't get really the shots they wanted, like they did in the in the Bethany game in the regional. They mm-hmm. just couldn't get the shots they wanted. Isabel Scales had 13 points and 11 rebounds, but again, she didn't. I, I don't think she got enough shots in the fourth quarter. Yeah. And again, that, but that's more about Marquette Catholic's defense, and I think not not being able to get the ball to Bell. They were they were much more physical than I thought they would be, mm-hmm. and and I think that was really effective as well. And you know, you talk about Pleasant; she didn't really have a, the greatest game against Caston, but boy, she came up with a big shot later on in the day, didn't she? Yeah, she's <laughs> the game-winning three-pointer with one second to go to beat Clinton Central was even 
It was even later than one second. It was basically right I at the buzzer. I thought they said one point one, but yeah. yeah, I thought it was the buzzer. But somebody said one point one, but yeah. yeah. To beat Clinton was... Central seventy two to seventy to beat that to score seventy two points on Clinton Central. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's crazy, and and she's just a freshman. Yeah, and she's just you know? a freshman. So, yeah. so it's uh, going to be a team that's going to be a factor in this uh, class A for a couple of years. Yeah, uh, with Caston, it was just again we we knew Marquette Catholic was good defensively. I but the nineteen turnovers even surprised me a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, Caston was again they were. Th- they were there going into the fourth quarter, but boy, when you're—I you know, think they were down 33-30 going into the fourth quarter. They had a few opportunities, but neither team could score like the, basically the first three or four minutes of the fourth quarter, and then just again it was Davis and the Marquette Catholic had enough free throws, and and again Caxton just did not get quality looks. I think at the basket, and I think that goes back to Marquette Catholic's defense. There was a there was a big moment there, and I think it was midway through the fourth quarter uh bell got kind of tied up there in the paint and coach douglas right as she got through the double team and is able to break through there she ends up putting the ball in the bucket and coach douglas had called a timeout Mm -hmm. and you know i I think that was a a big one there took a couple points off the board but uh you know he's he's trying to preserve the possession i mean you can't blame coach douglas for that but uh it was it was just a, uh, a Marquette team. I mean, give them credit; they were as physical as Caston, and and probably as physical of a team that Caston has faced all year. Yeah, just uh, in general. And that's interesting because I mean, Cast has faced Carroll and yeah Bremen and yeah. yeah. You know, I, I thought Tri County played them pretty physical, but I, yeah. I think Marquette was even a step higher than that. Yeah, I want to give a shout out to to Annie Harsh with three threes and scored nine yeah. points. Yeah, she was huge. And I think Maddie Douglas had eight. Mm-hmm. And then what two each for Zimpleman and Hinderleiter? Yeah, yeah. To they, go along with the thirteen and eleven boards for for uh, scales. Yeah. Great season for the Lady Comets. Great career for five seniors that uh, you know they're going to obviously have right. another season to go here in softball. But uh, what a difference maker that team that uh, group of girls has been for the whole program. Yeah, uh, there was a lot of pressure on that team to win a sectional. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot. I mean, more more so than just about any girls team that I've covered. Mm-hmm. For that, I mean, it it all came down to what they would do that particular week in February, and for them to come through and, and do that, I I give them just a huge salute. I mean, mm-hmm. that's, I mean, they, you know, a lot of teams they win a sectional; it's a pleasant surprise. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was something that, I mean, and it all came down to this year because the. Those tough losses to North White in both 2022 and 2023. Yeah, I think the 23 one was kind of the most shocking one. Mm-hmm. You know, that that was kind of the one is like, you know, they're juniors. North White graduated a bunch of girls. And when they lost that game, then, you know, Tri-County ends up winning that sectional. That, I think, added to the pressure that they faced, you know, they felt this year. Yeah. So... But, uh, yeah, great careers and, you know, looking forward to uh, seeing what they can do here this spring on the uh, softball diamond because they're not done. You know, they made it all the way over to Purdue last year. Can they do it again? Yeah. Maybe, uh, you know, find a different result. Mm-hmm. So looking forward to seeing how that goes. Uh, some other girls' basketball news. We had some uh, all-conference uh, teams that were posted for both the TRC and the uh, Hoosier North. Uh, just have the one team that we cover in the uh, TRC now. So Ella McCarter, Riley Clevenger, both voted first team all TRC. And uh, honorable mention, the freshman, Aubrey Wilson. Yeah. So, uh, you know, sh- showing some uh, some love for, for what the Rochester Zebras were able to do with just seven girls. Right. Uh, I think Ella wound up averaging about seven and a half points a game. I think Riley was around ten. And I think... Uh... Aubrey was around seven points a game as well. But, again, Ella, I think, led the team in. She was second in the team in rebounding behind Jane Field and also led the team in assists. So really a well-deserved uh, honor for Ella, and I'm glad that her all-around game was really recognized right. by the coaches. Right. And of course, Riley, I mean, her shooting really kind of bailed. It, it's a lot of times when Rochester struggled to score, and it, it was Riley's shooting was kind of keeping the offense afloat. And then Aubrey, who came on, you know, she had that great game at McConaughey uh, around mid-November, and then kind of, you know, then kind of didn't emerge. Then kind of, I don't want to say went into a slump, but 
wasn't as aggressive offensively and really came out at the end of the year mm-hmm. and was really playing her best basketball offensively. And you saw how good she was off the dribble, and yet she could hit the three as well. Uh, I'm just so excited to see what Aub- Aubrey becomes oh, yeah. as a basketball player yeah. moving forward now that she's got this year under her belt. Yeah, really solid player. I don't think we ever really said, well, she's doing that. She's just a freshman. I think that we just kind of – Right, we forgot you know, about that after yeah, a while. Yeah, pretty quickly in the season. And really after Christmas um, – yeah, she was just another player out there. She was just doing what needed to be done. So, you know, no seniors for that Rochester team, so obviously everyone's going to be back, and hopefully they can add a couple and, and maybe get enough for, a, a, a you know, a JV team and, you know, get that program uh, rolling again as far as JV and varsity. Right, right. And, again, I'm again, everybody should be excited about the future of this team, especially going down to 2A. Mm-hmm. And if they can get more numbers, that would even make it, things even better. Yeah. The only, the only bad thing is we're looking at possibly having Bremen move to 2A as well. Right. <laughs> they had a great season, and they're going to have most everybody back. Right, and their enrollment is smaller than Rochester's in so the next cycle, so almost certainly they're going to be in 2A. Yeah. Uh, HNAC-wise, the Hoosier North Athletic Conference MVP, Isabel Scales from Caston. If it had been anybody else, <laughs> there would have had to have been an There's investigation. There's no question. No question. She was the MVP of that. Addison Zippelman, Maddie Douglas, both – First team all conference from Caston and Macy Hindelider was honorable mention from Caston as well. Right, I mean Addison was a no a no daughter. I mean I think she she wound up averaging what twelve points a game this year. Uh, again, she everybody talked about how much Addison loved softball, but I think Addison is a basketball player. How much she grew in that sport as well, mm-hmm. and she became just more of a complete scorer. I think she learned how to she learned how to work with Bell work with scales in terms of getting those um, and moving without the ball and getting mm-hmm. her opportunities that way. Mm-hmm. So she was never just totally dependent on shooting the three. Yeah. The the game at uh, Caston in the regional, that was a, a perfect example of uh, Addison and, and Bell working together with the way they were cutting and passing. It was uh, yeah. it was pretty. Yeah. Yeah. And then Maddie is, you know, somebody you could she she could shoot the three, but she also got a lot of buckets in transition in the year. And she, you know, was a great, but I mean, she also understood her role as a point guard as well. So it's tough for a point guard when you when you have to score, but also kind of set up your teammates. And you know, that was a big role that she took on. So kudos to her. Big kudos because you know, coming in as a freshman with this senior dominated team, you don't know how that's all going to work. Plus, you're the coach's daughter. You know, is it going to be kind of one of those things? You know, well, she's getting this or whatever. Mm-hmm. But uh, she fit right in with that group, and you know basically brought them what they had been missing, which was a true point guard. Yeah. And uh, kudos to her. She had a great freshman year. And uh, Macy Hindelider as well. You know, I've talked about her over the years. I just, you know, the kid just works. Uh Uh-huh. She just goes out and she puts in the work. And, you know, she doesn't get the kudos, the accolades all the time like some of the other girls do. But uh, she is right there putting in the work as well. And great senior season for her. You know, I always asked her about, you know, what what have you worked on in your game? She always, she always talks about defense. Mm-hmm. It's always the first word out of her mouth, but I think she became a better offensive player. Didn't necessarily score a ton of points, but really helped out with her ball with her ball handling. I think that was something she got she got much better at her ball handling and just her decision making with the ball in her hands. Mm-hmm. And I think when you do that, your the offensive opportunities will come to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, Culver senior Grace Siebert was named first team all conference as well. She's one of those that we've talked about a lot over the years. Great shooter, you know, ran the point for uh, the Cavaliers and just a, a great all around kid as well. Right. I mean, Culver's had a lot of good point guards over the years, and Grace is, she would rank up there with a lot of them. Uh, she's, I mean, in terms of, and again, it was it was a tough situation. I don't think she that was quite the teammates, the roster that she had, or she thought she would have. But really uh, was somebody who was, you know, she was really quick, uh, but was really uh, became a better leader, became a better shooter, and uh, again, I uh, put put her heart put her heart out there at all times, and I absolutely that's well deserved for her to make the first team. And I'm glad I'm glad the coaches noticed her mm-hmm. for a team that kind of struggled otherwise. Yeah, I got a little bit of an affinity for the next girl as uh, McKenna Stricker from Pioneer is also named first team. All conference and talk about a, a you know not a, having the team you thought you were going to have uh, you know yeah, that's or a, the coach you thought you were going to have right. you know kind of got behind the eight ball a little bit to start but uh, you know getting 
seven wins on the season, uh, you know, and, and still has another year to go. Right, and after graduating Ashland Brook and, and Paula Collado Fernandez, I mean, that, that was a lot that they were missing in the backcourt. And so she, I mean, it, again, it, it was a lot to ask of McKenna, but she averaged 13 points a game, plus three and a half assists, and she had the ball in her hands a lot. And she was a pretty good rebounder for a guard as well. Mm-hmm. So, again, uh, McKenna's became a complete player. We had, we had seen signs of that in the previous years, uh, pre- or first two years. Obviously, just getting on the court as a freshman was a was a major sig- was a major sign for her, and really kind of became. Uh, just more and more comfortable in that lead guard role. Uh, kudos to McKenna for a great year. Yeah, Candace Croft from Winnemac, first team All Conference, and honorable mention Maggie Smith. Yeah, Candace hit just so many big shots for Winnemac when they when they really needed it. And Candace is just uh, she's just always seems to get make the big defensive play. She's just. She's very smooth out there, um, but she's also strong at the same time. And always, as as much as Candace scored, I think her I think her best skill was her defense. Mm-hmm. I mean, she could really just bother opposing teams' point guards and keep them from getting into their offense. If you're gonna if you're gonna play for Coach Tony Stasiak, you better be a good defensive player. Yeah, <laughs> and of course Maggie Smith was that as well. I yeah. think. Maggie wasn't quite as consistent scoring wise as maybe Candace was, yeah. and that's why uh, she didn't make the first team. But Maggie uh, just played was so much hard out there, and just just ask McKenna about uh, Maggie's defense. She'll tell you in that sectional game. Yeah, she moves her feet yeah. so well. Yeah, and again, in terms of endurance, you don't have to worry about Maggie. She was a state qualifier in cross country, so she can play all day if she needs to. Yeah, and uh, again, improved her shooting a little bit. I mean, she was never. I don't think no shooting was ever her forte, but again, she she was somebody that kept you honest if you were guarding her. Yeah, yeah. With her shooting, uh, there were a couple of. I, I was really hoping that Mia McCagg would have gotten some recognition, and hoping Marissa Iverson would get some recognition, yeah. so we might have to do something about that ourselves yeah. when we come up with our team. Yeah, Iverson really came on late in the season for Winnemac. Yeah, this, really, yeah, we yeah. we were hoping that they would have gotten some recognition. But, yeah. but we have our own team, so we'll have our own say, and we'll yeah, we, we might be talking about those kids again. All right, that's it for girls basketball. Oh, uh, the Hoosier Plains team came out just oh, yeah, recently. Yeah, Samantha Redinger named the Hoosier Plains MVP. Right, no big surprise there, and also made it to the first team. And then uh, Ellie Bolenbacher and Morgan Barkus both both made honorable mention. Okay. Well, they called it second team. Or second team. Yeah, they called it. They had a little different. Second team, yeah. 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 So, yeah, Morgan and Ellie will be back next year. So, of Mm -hmm. course, uh, Samantha, the leading scorer in the state. So, right. Uh, We got, yeah, we got the numbers. uh, The Cameron Runner of Hamilton Heights wound up scoring more total points than Sam, Uh but Sam still leads in scoring average at 29.8. And that's, she's going to lead the state. Okay. Twenty nine point eight. Yeah. But in terms of if somebody tells you that Samantha did not lead the state in scoring, it's because Runner wound up with more she wound up with like seven seven fifteen and yeah. Sam well, had she like, played more games. But obviously. she made play more games. Yeah, yeah and Sam had made six semi state. Made it her teammate at semi state. Sam yeah. had like six ninety or six eighty eight, something like that. So yeah. Which is a which is a single season school record for Argus, which that's a huge accomplishment. Right. Been a couple of good players that have had some pretty high seasons. Yeah. So. So. Yep. Uh, yeah. Just wanted to clarify that. Yep. All right. We'll take a break here. We'll get into some boys basketball talk when we get back. Talking sports with Val. Mike Anderson in Rochester is here to set you up with a new set of wheels. From coming on the lot to driving off in your new dream car, Mike Anderson strives to give you the smoothest dealership experience. Not only that, but Mike Anderson in Rochester is here to lend a hand with their service center to keep your ride running. Stop on in for a test drive or call today at 574-223-2711 to see how Mike Anderson in Rochester can steer you in the right direction. Since 1974, Steve Moore Agency has provided the City of Rochester with customized insurance solutions that will fit your needs. With a variety of coverage policies for business, home, auto, life, and more, Steve Moore Agency is sure to cover all your insurance needs. Call now at 574-223-3010 or stop on in at 602 East 9th Street to see what Brody Moore at Steve Moore Agency can do for you. 
At Webb's Family Pharmacy, we strive to provide our community with a better alternative. We respect the many choices our patients have when it comes to health care needs. When they choose us, we go above and beyond to offer them personalized service and care that will consistently remind them of why we are a superior choice to other pharmacies. Pharmacy care should be proactive when possible. It should be customized to patient needs. It should strive for better health outcomes. It should help manage costs. At Webb's Family Pharmacy, our mission is to provide the pharmacy care you deserve. Fulton County REMC is proud to offer the Operation Roundup Charitable Giving Program. Through Operation Roundup, Fulton County REMC is able to give to local organizations and communities by simply rounding up your monthly bill and donating the change. Since its inception, Operation Roundup has generated over 50 million in charitable donations throughout 260 electric cooperatives. To learn more about this great program, visit www.fultoncountyremc.com or call in at 574-223-3156. Welcome back here, talking sports with Val on a Friday afternoon. One of the big things we talked about in the open, Val, was the uh, boys' uh, sectional draw happened on Sunday. Uh, we're actually going to do a, a little bit of a separate uh, show. We're going to cover that. So uh, look for that on the website. We're going to do that as soon as we finish here. So we will have the draw show and uh, talk about uh, the matchups on that. So the Rochester Zebras, as they uh, wind down the season, they still have a home game with the McConaughey Braves coming up tonight. Um, it's been a rough stretch for the Zebras. Um, they've been really close, but unfortunately, you know, not able to get the wins. And yeah, let me ask you a trivia question. Rochester's played five games decided by five points or less. What's their record in those five games? This year's? Yeah. Oh, and five. One and four. They did win? Yeah, okay. one and four. But that's, that's the problem. They just haven't won close games. Mm -hmm. uh, they had that five-game losing streak, but only four of the five losses were by single digits. And the only loss was by double digits was by ten at Triton. And yeah. they're only, in that game, they were only down by two late in the third quarter. So they just have struggled to win close games. Yeah, yeah, and unfortunately, uh, the uh, Peru Tigers, uh, boy, this one, this one was back and forth. We were down at Peru last uh, Friday for this one, and... You know, at times it looked like uh, Rochester was going to get this one, but uh, we'll just go through here and give you some of the highlights here. So, right, we were kind of curious to see how this game would evolve. What you know, what would Rochester do in terms of guarding Matt Redker? We did not know that uh, Bryce Bogger would be out, and that certainly affected because we thought he would get the defensive matchup on Redker. Uh, but yeah, it was a pretty fast-paced game. Yeah, Jonas Kaiser got the start in place of uh, Bryce, and I would say that he performed very well. Yeah. I mean, you got to give him kudos for that. On the road in a conference game on your first start of your career, that's he played very well. Right, Rochester went with, what, uh, Kaiser, Reinerts, Bowers, Pollock, and uh, the Prater. Yeah, normal starters, I think, besides uh, Bryce was not in and, and Jonas was in for him. And again, this was a pretty fast-paced first quarter. Rochester would lead uh, by four at the end of one quarter. Boy, Tanner Reynolds was just terrific in this game. He had five threes and scored 19 points. You know, obviously, Peru led by Ross and Rector. I mean, they've just been a thorn in everybody's side for the yeah. last four years. But, you know, the Zebras... Build up a little bit of a lead in that second quarter. Right, they went up by eight there, thirty-two twenty-four. As good as Ross and as good as Retker and Ross were, the, neither of them were the leading scorer for Peru in this game. That was Zach Eldridge, who had twenty-one. But again, it just seemed like Rochester was matching Peru shot for shot. In fact, uh, a little better than yeah, that. better yeah. than that, yeah. But uh, unfortunately, the third quarter happened. Yeah, we're going to get to that in a minute. Oh, we're in that now. The right. And it was interesting because Coach Malco. I talked with him about this game. He goes, "We we missed some layups mm -hmm. in the second quarter. Even though we were up by seven at halftime, we felt like we should have been up by thirteen or fi by fifteen. Yeah, yeah. He said that in the post game. You know, if if they would have made some of the easy shots that they didn't make in that second quarter, he thought they'd be up that 
number, and then when Peru making the run that they did in the third quarter, then Rochester would either be right there or maybe even still ahead. And right, that, and that segment very late in the third quarter, then they go 48-44. I mean, that was just tough. I mean, kudos to the Zebras. They continued to battle even after, you know, relinquishing the lead. But Right. Uh, mentioned Kaiser with 14. Owen Prater had 10. I think it was at Reinerts who hits a three, but Reinerts had five threes and scored 19. You know, Randy and uh, Coach Malco both mentioned, you know, in 16 seasons, <laughs> Coach Malco has not won a game at Peru. Yeah. I mean, that's that's saying something for Peru as far as protecting the home floor. Right, and the thing is, I think he's only lost by double digits there like once or twice. Yeah. It's, Even though he's never won there, they've all been basically close games. There's, right. There was, I know there was a 60-59 to 59 game there one year. I think there was a 47-45. That was with uh, McCarter and Stasiak and Reinerts a couple of years, yeah. Kyle Reinerts a couple of years ago. So, yeah. I mean, there have just been these close games, these close losses. I remember Jordan Reinholdt, when he was a senior in Austin Utter, they they go there and lose in overtime at Peru. Yeah, they just have not been able to squeeze out a win at Tiger Arena. It's just been kind of this house of horrors for them over the years. Yeah. Fortunately for the Zebras, though, they get uh, things righted a little bit as they uh, come back home for senior night on Tuesday and put up 86 points against a, an OD team that's, you know, struggled to get wins this year, but it's not a terrible team. And to put up 86 points, and I think you said it was the highest point total that the Zebras have had since 2009. Since 2009, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, that's saying a lot. They've had some really good teams since then. So Right, and Rochester's per game average now is around, I think, 57 or 58. Yeah. And that would, that's uh, the, the uh, 2010 team average, 57.7. That was Nate Basham. Colt Meadows, Evan Hoff, Colin Harris. They haven't averaged that many points in a game since that was 14 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now this team is averaging right around that total as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's been that's, – that's a per-game average. And, of course, mm -hmm. the 86 as a team goes back to 2009. So, yeah. yeah. And, again, it, was, it wasn't – it was not pouring it on. It was just running their offense. Mm -hmm. They didn't press a whole lot. It was just basically good ball movement. Passing and shooting. Yeah. It, and it, in the second half, Rochester almost went out of their way not to shoot threes. Yeah. So that puts the Zebras at 9 and 11, 4 and 4 in the conference with a uh, a big one looming tonight with Josiah Ball averaging over 30 a game, leading the state in scoring. How do you slow down Josiah Ball? He leads the state, and McConaughey leads the state as a team in scoring, averaging around 76 a game. <laughs> Nobody's figured out how to stop him because he's just. He's just an impossible matchup. I mean, he's 6'5", so he can score he, he, with his back to the basket, but then he's got that pull-up jump shot, and he, with his vertical, you can't block his shot. Right. <laughs> and and he can his handle is so good. Yeah. I mean, there's just that many 6'5 guys who can handle it, and then he can drive to the basket, and he, he gets to the hoop in one or two strides. So he is just a tough matchup. But in a lot of ways, the key to beating McConaughey is stopping the other guys. Yeah. Fuddy Kyle and... Uh, A.J. Kelly have just, they're both extremely athletic. Yeah. A.J. Kelly, if he's not the quickest player in the TRC, he's right up there. Well, and then, you saw him catch a or kick off yeah. in football. Mm -hmm. I mean, 35 yards down the field, he caught it in the air. Yeah. I mean, you got to be kind of fast to do that. Right, right. And he's a state qualifier in track. And then, but in a lot of ways, their X factor is Ethan Zeiser. When Zeiser is going, he gives them a fourth score, and uh -huh. then. They go from scoring 75 to scoring 85 or 90, and then then they really become hard to beat. So I'm really curious to see how this game uh, kind of plays out because I don't think the Zebras the zebras don't play slow either. They, see, uh, playing Trying to slow McConaughey down, I don't know if that would fit the Zebras either. So mm -hmm. and uh, Again, so it's going to come down to, to being able to handle McConaughey's pressure and then attacking it once you get pe once you get past uh, that kind of that first line and and get shots at the rim. How much of a factor is the uh, the memory of last year's game at McConaughey going to be for the Zebras? That's I think I think that's a big question because that was an ugly game and the Zebras did not show up at all. And 
Well, they did though. Right. I, mean, I mean, the first quarter and a half, yeah. it was it was right there, but it just seemed like the the train went off the tracks. And yeah. When it did, it went down the hill. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It really went down the hill. Right. The Bauer Maple, I know, was tremendous last year. He's graduated, so. But again, this is they're still potent offensively. So. Yeah. And and Josiah Ball is just a junior. Yeah. <laughs> so he's still got another year to go. Right. And. Where will both teams mind? Both teams have a Tuesday night sectional game, so mm-hmm. where will both teams' frame of mind be at? Especially since the, neither team has a chance to win the conference. Yeah, and for you know Rochester, obviously uh, a big one because you know they got Wabash. So you know, where, are they going to be looking ahead to try and figure things out with you know to get Wabash or what, where are they going to be yeah. at mentally? Yeah, so. That's going to be interesting to see. Uh, we'll have that one coming up next here on Channel 4 from Rochester High School. Um, let's talk a little bit here um, quickly about the Argus Dragons as they are 10-11. and 11. Last Friday they lost on the road at North Judson, 42-47. Got a win at home against North Newton on Saturday, 55-49. And then they uh, finally got that Jimtown game in last night. They lose to the Jimmies 39-57. And they're going to finish off tonight at 12-9 and Elkhart uh, Christian Academy. So if they can get the win, yeah. uh, it would be a big conference win for them and finish the season 500. Well, let's get right to the big news. Sean Richard did not play against Jimtown last night. He has been sick. He has not been in school all week. Oh. So... Uh, that's why they didn't play on Tuesday, probably. That's why they right. Yeah. The, right part the, of the reason. Part of the reason. Yeah. Uh, so again, we don't know if Sean's going to be available against Elkhart Christian tonight. Obviously, the big game to be ready for is the sectional game against Westville on Wednesday. So we'll see there again. Sean had a tremendous game against North Newton. I think he had he had twenty six, and Luke Stoltz had twenty five, but then he got six. So we'll see. On top of that, Kenyon Belden did not play against Jimtown either. Due to what I, I exchanged a couple of emails with uh, Jason Breeden, he said that was a violation of school rules on Kenyon. Okay. So the starting lineup against Jimtown was um, Stoltz, Hensler, Austin, Helms, and Sawyer Crace got a start oh. on the varsity. Yeah. So without Belden and Richard, and then uh, some of the, uh, McMillan came off the bench. Uh, who hadn't seen much playing time this year. So we'll see. Uh, uh, Hensler did have 10 points against Jimtown last night. Mm-hmm. And kudos to Luke Stoltz to score 24 when against Jimtown when half of Bogo Township had to have been guarding him, I yeah. would imagine. Yeah. So, again, we'll see if uh, if Argus can get their full roster intact for the Westville game. I wonder what's going on up in northern Indiana because OD had kind of the same thing where, you know, it, it went from a full JV game to a half a JV game to ended up being no JV game. Yeah. Due to, you know, they had some illness going through up there as well. So, right. Yeah. Must be a must be a northern Indiana thing. Yeah. Hopefully they, they can keep it up there. We don't need any of that. Yeah, we don't there. need any of that, yeah. especially this time of year. So, yeah, so it's going to be a tough one against a really good Elkhart Christian team at Elkhart Christian. Right. But, uh, you know, obviously the big one is going to be next week at Triton. Yeah, that was a nice one over North Newton, by the way, last Saturday, 55-49. We talked about that Evan Gagnon of North Newton. He had mm-hmm. 31 in that game, and yet they, they Argus found a way to pull that one out. Yeah. After a tough and after a second half of a back-to-back after a tough loss at Judson. Yeah. Um, I think the boys put together a little highlight reel of that one, if you want to look at that here. Okay. Um, yeah, there it is, Argus and North Newton. We can take a look at that. I want to thank uh, Kate and Caleb for uh, really stepping up. I've kind of taken on a little bit of a new role here where I'm doing some outside sales for phone and Internet. So they've stepped up and helped out doing some, some highlight videos for us. And the Argus Dragons here hosting North Newton, that one was uh, last Saturday. At, right, again, uh, a pretty solid North Newton team in 2A. Yeah, in addition to the schedule for the uh, the Dragons, correct? Right, something that, yeah, again, they needed uh, both OD games got canceled. The regular season game and the Bi-County Consolation game. So they needed two games. Clinton Christian was one of those games they, they added, and then North Newton was the other. It was kind of weird there. You talk about Bi-County Consolation games. OD canceled both boys' and girls' games. Yeah. So against Argus. You talked about uh, Gagnon, you know, when was that, 20, 
21 that we saw him over at uh, Delphi. Yeah, yeah. In, in the in the sectional there. And he was the, a freshman at the time, yeah. and we liked what we saw then, but yeah. he's become a big-time scorer for the Spartans. And he's a senior now. And Coach Zachary, uh, he was – Again, kudos to him and kudos to the North Newton administration for letting him build his program. It, you know, they, um, he was the foot. He was actually the football coach at Tri County, okay, and became the basketball. He, he left that job to become the boys' basketball coach in North Newton, which is hmm. it was weird. It's one thing to leave one school and go to another in the same sport. He not only left the school, he changed sports. But he was a very good basketball player at um, Sheridan back in the day, okay, and has done a nice job building this North Newton program. They're a lot more competitive, but again, Argus would be able to run the run out the clock and win by six. Probably had some football experience at Sheridan too, I would assume. Yeah, <laughs> might might be a the coach. Zachary family is very well known at Sheridan. Might be a coach down there that they've probably heard of. Yeah, but yeah. right. Yeah. So, yeah, his older brother was even a better football player than he was, and he yeah. was good. He was good. Yeah. So yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, I guess the big thing, obviously, for Argus is just get healthy. Yeah, I mean that's that's the big thing right now. Get 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 their full roster back. Yeah, because right. a healthy a healthy Sean Richard affects everybody. Right, right, and you know they're not real deep to begin with. Yeah. So when you start talking about two or three kids that are missing, then all of a sudden you're getting down. No offense to Sawyer Crace, but he's been playing JV all year, and yeah. then all of a sudden you're putting him in as a varsity starter against a good Jimtown <laughs> right. team. You know, Jimtown's a good team in a very good conference. Yeah, yeah. So. All right, let's take another quick break here, and uh, when we come back, we will uh, talk about the cast and comets, Culver Cavaliers, Pioneer Panthers, here on Talking Sports with Val. RTC is partnering with the Fiber Gaming Network program. If you live in a zip code that RTC Fiber Communications provides service to, you can participate for free. The Fiber Gaming Network is affiliated with eSports and is offering cash prizes for competitions every week. If you have an account, sign in today and register for upcoming events. And if you don't, simply visit www.fibergamingnetwork.com and create a free account to get started. Are you ready to take your home's comfort to the next level? The Insulation Guys can evaluate your attic, walls, basement, and crawl space to determine where insulation can be added or upgraded. Our expert team delivers high quality insulation solutions, not only improving your home's comfort, but also lowering your energy bills. Call us today for a free quote at 574-223-3626 or visit us online at www.theinsulationguys.net. My name is Tasha Mitchell and I am a commercial lender for Alliance Bank. Behind me is the spreader I currently use to applicate dry fertilizer product. Very unexpectedly did I become a commercial banker. I've only been a commercial banker for about nine months, and with my ag experience, it has really helped me. I would choose Alliance Bank because even though they have seven branches, they are a very community-oriented bank. They give a lot back to the community, and their clients are their top priority. Looking for a better way to incentivize your staff or provide them with custom apparel to boost morale? Allow the winning edge to set you up with a custom edge store tailored to your business needs. Whether you need supplies for your fundraiser or shirts with your business logo on them, the Winning Edge can help you set up an online one-stop shop. Call today at 574-223-6090 or visit their website at www.thewinningedgeathletics.com. Welcome back here talking sports with Val. Let's talk about the cast and comments currently well, their season is closed because they uh, finished off last night with a good win on uh, their home court, senior night against North Miami, 62-31 over the Warriors. The Comets end their regular season with a 10-12 and record, 3-4 and in the conference. Uh, a couple losses, though, before last night. They lost at LaVille on Friday, 51-68, and then Tuesday on the road at Winnemac, losing that one, 50-59. Uh, do have some highlights of that one for you here. Want to take a look at that? As the uh, the Comets big conference game, Ryan and Cass has had a very good uh, long term history since Carl Davis has been the coach against Winnemac. Uh, I think they've beaten them what four or five years in a row. Well, 
this really turned into a, a really uh, uh, the the offensive execution in this game was just really good. And again, what makes Caston um, such a tough team to guard is they've got the perimeter shooters in Stinson and Zyder, but then Stinson can also drive to the basket and score, but they've also also the, they've got with Hook and Yaden, they get two guys who can score in the paint. So it's Caston can score in kind of a variety of different ways. And it's even a different team, I think, than the than the team from, you know, two, three years ago when they had, you know, Sam Smith and 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 Cade Zider and and uh, Joey Spin. I mean, it's it's similar to, but even, maybe even more dynamic than that. But having said that, you know, John Malco has been great, and he was tough to guard for Caston in this game. I think that was Hook scoring on the inside. That was a real nice shot. That was he was pretty much blanketed in there. Yeah, it's something you don't see a lot. Back to the basket move and actually using the glass. Yeah. It's, what's that anymore, right? The thing about Talon Zyder is you can have a hand in his face. He's, that's, he's not, not going to deter him. You need to do more than that. Because uh, he can hit a shot with, with, a, with a hand in his face. I think, uh, you know, with Winnemac, I mean, the. I think Brendan Hines was big in this game. Yeah, this is Hines with a big three-pointer. I think he had 17 in this game, and he was tough for the Caston defense to stop, and Caston kept hanging in there. You know, Brendan Hines is just, he was great as a freshman, but he's just really improved every year since then. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's just, and he's gotten bigger too. Yeah. Because he was about, what, 5'2", maybe as a freshman, but... uh, He's grown, and, and his strength and his uh, court vision are just really good. And uh, they would run out the clock, and Winnemac wins 59-50. to 50. So a nice win for Winnemac, who had, who had really struggled against Caston in recent years. Uh, that closed out Caston's conference record at 3-4. and four. Then Caston came out and beat North Miami 62-31 to 31. last night. I was at that game. Uh, it was basically a pretty good game for about a quarter. 13 to 11. It looked like North Miami was trying to play a little slower. Mm-hmm. I hadn't seen North Miami play in a while and trying to kind of lengthen possessions a little bit. But then Talon Zyder has three big threes. They go on a, uh, I think it was like a 17 to 3 run, or a, and it went from, and it, all of a sudden it was 30 to 16. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden North Miami can't play slow anymore. They've got to push the tempo. And it was Talon hitting three big threes. Um, Cast and hit seven threes for the game, six of them in the first half, only one in the second half. But in the second half, the story was Caston's defense. Mm-hmm. Coach Davis went from a man, mostly a man in the first half, and then kind of started out playing a little man to start the second half. But then went to a 2-3 zone to start the second half. And again, we've talked about Coach Davis. He's been playing a little more zone this year than ever before. And this was really, this was the best the zone has looked. Now, I hadn't seen Caston play in person in about a month. And, you know, we always talk about the narrative of the season, how things progress, how players progress, how teams progress. The Caston zone is now much, much better, and it's something that Coach Davis is not afraid to go to. And they really were able to step into passing lanes. And there was just a flood of turnovers that led to fast breaks. And all of a sudden, Caston went on a huge run. They went on a 22-2 run in the second half. And all of a sudden, you look up and it's 60-24, to and there's a running clock. Yeah. Yeah, it seemed like it was just like that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, again, uh, Stinson led the way with 16. Zyder had 14. And Grant Yaden, who a senior didn't start on senior night because they have six seniors and mm-hmm. somebody had to sit start. Well, Grant comes off the bench. He had eight points and seven rebounds. And Grant Yaden has made a huge difference. Again, we talk about the narrative of the season. Now, the way he's playing with so much more confidence. And you can run pick and roll with him. You mm-hmm. can run high-low with him and hook yeah. Grant's a really nice passer, too. Mm-hmm. I had no idea. Mm-hmm. And so watching him, if you, you play a zone against Cass, and they're going to put Grant at the high post, and, he, and it's hard. And, I mean, you need a map to get around his rear end. I mean, he's just a big <laughs> hoss of a kid. Mm-hmm. And and 
it was just a lot for North Miami to cover. And even though Casson put 62 points on the board, even though it was a pretty slow-paced game for first quarter and a half, mm -hmm. and the more attention he gets, that's going to help out Hook, and it's going to help out the other guys too. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see, and we'll talk about the matchups, but, uh, you know, obviously Caston hosting sectional 52, so it's intriguing to see, you know, right. they they lost that early season game to Frontier. You know, I think that, you know, they play that game nine, ten times, they win nine of them. Tri-County, on the other hand, I was at that game. Mm -hmm. That's going to be an interesting matchup, so we'll see how that goes. Right. That wouldn't be until the sectional final. Right, right. We always talk about Caston's February schedule every year, how brutal it is. This year they went four and four in February, hmm. pretty good. I mean, yeah. I think you, I think you take that. Yeah. Um, so again, ten and twelve. I know it was a three game losing streak up until the North Miami game, but again they get that win. There's a little better feeling now. They get a whole week to prepare. Yeah. Let's talk about the Culver Cavaliers at nine and twelve. Uh, they have one more game tonight at home versus Bremen. They got a win on the road Saturday at Tri Township, seventy two fifty eight. Uh, Tuesday they won uh, versus Granger Christian 67-35. That was a late add too. They were supposed to play a by county consolation game against it was New Prairie. Yeah. And that game got canceled, so that opened a slot in the schedule. So they found a game. They they got a game with Granger Christian. Yeah. Uh, Wednesday they lose at home versus Triton, but boy, I would say they got to feel pretty good. Thirty six forty one. I mean, they were right. in that game the whole the whole right. way. I know Justin Croy and Mike Zaner did that game. I was there for that game as well, and I wrote a story about it. Um, again, they trailed by ten in the second quarter. They trailed seventeen to seven, but really just kept fighting and fighting and fighting. And their zone press gave Triton fits. Um, Triton wound up committing 19, eighteen turnovers for the game. Culver only had thirteen turnovers. Uh, but again, Triton, they're so good defensively, and their physicality, I think, gave Culver some problems. And the other big stat was free throw shooting. Triton was 7 for 10, and Culver was 2 for 10. Mm. And we've talked about Culver's free throw shooting woes. It's been mm. kind of a problem all year. Well, that, that gives you your five points, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Mm. Again, Rogers had 16, and Adria Guasp had 9. And one thing I asked about Kyle Evans after the game is, do you want to see Guasp be more aggressive? And yeah, I mean... He, if anything, he needs to shoot more. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but again, kudos to Triton. It was a gutty win. They didn't play great. Uh, the sophomore guard Landon Patrick uh, scored 11, hit a big three-pointer late. They gave him a six-point lead, uh, and that was kind of enough cushion. Rogers hit a three, but again, points were hard to come by in this game. Triton was able to pull it out, 41-36. Jacob Pitney was out for Triton due to an ankle. Triton was coming off losses uh, to Plymouth and Bremen in their previous two games, so they they really needed to win for their confidence. Mm -hmm. But without Pitney, his his injury kind of affected them. We'll see how they are moving forward. And they've they've got a big game at Knox to uh, you know secure the eighth it's, snack. It's home versus Knox. It's, it's at home. The, it's at the okay. trench. So yeah, again, Triton with the win. They again, and Triton couldn't play in vanilla. They needed that game against Culver, mm -hmm. even though they drew him in the sectional. And we'll talk about that later. But, yeah, Triton needed that game, so they couldn't play in vanilla. Uh, they clinched a share of the conference title with that yeah. win. They can clinch it outright with a win at home uh, over Knox on Friday. Uh, LaVille is in the barn at 6-1. and one. They'll be rooting for Knox. Yeah. And then, uh, obviously, Culver and uh, Triton will be meeting up again at the trench next Wednesday. Right. And so the key is, and uh, we should mention, David Hyde did not score. He played against Triton, but he did not score. And he only played kind of sparingly. Uh, he didn't. He started the game, but he did not start the second half. He played a little bit in the second half, but he just again. I didn't get a minutes total. It was probably around maybe ten minutes total. Hmm. He wasn't in foul trouble, so I. He was dealing with a hip injury, so we'll see how David is moving forward. Obviously, Culver plays Bremen tonight at home, uh, and that's it'll be a really good prep game. But again, I don't think Coach Evans is going to push it with David. They really need him uh, back for that sectional game. Yeah. All right, let's take another quick break here, and we'll wrap up. I want to give a shout-out to Brady Kindernay. He's, he's back in the lineup. He's made a difference. Okay. We'll take a break, and we'll wrap things up with our final segment when we get back here talking sports with Val. Evans Agency is here to match you with the best insurance solutions that fit your needs. Whether you need coverage for home, business, auto, or life, Evans Agency will make sure you have the protection you need no matter what life throws your way. With a heart and a hand for friendship, Evans Agency is here for you. Call 574-224-6988 or visit online at www.evansagencyllc.com. 
Here at Timbercrest Senior Living Community, residents and independent living are able to enjoy an active lifestyle and a beautiful campus. With plenty of activities, including walking and biking paths, fitness classes and social events, there's always something for residents to engage in to benefit their mental, physical and spiritual well-being. Contact us today to schedule a tour and discover the active lifestyle and beautiful campus our residents enjoy every day. Say hello to a whole new world of growing possibilities with Nutrient Ag Solutions. Let the experts at Nutrient Ag Solutions help you realize the highest crop yield with the most sustainable solutions possible. Stop by their local location just east of Fulton or call at 574-857-3555 or visit online at www.nutrientagsolutions.com to see how Nutrient can help you. New Holland Rochester knows that farmers need equipment they can trust and rely on. That's why for over 125 years, New Holland has been innovating to develop the best and most sustainable products available for our customers. Check out our full fleet that includes our lineup of small compact tractors online at www.NewHollandRochester.com or stop in at one of our locations in Rochester or Logansport to see how we can serve you. Welcome back here talking sports with Val as we wrap things up here for a Friday afternoon. Remember, we're going to do a separate show where we're going to talk about the boys' basketball sectional draw and the sectional matchups coming up. So we'll post that one here in a bit as well. Let's talk about the Pioneer Panthers, Val, as they um, set at eight and twelve with a three and four mark, a three and four conference mark. They still have a, a couple games to go. They host Tri County tonight and uh, West Central tomorrow to wrap up the season. Um, they uh, split a pair of games last Friday. They uh, lost at home to Winnemac 31-52 and came back and won versus North White uh, 45-40. Not sure there. That was a little bit of a surprise, 31-52. They were coming in off of a uh, pretty hot streak in the conference. And, uh, you know, not saying right. it's a surprise to lose to Winnemac, but by that much. By that much, especially uh, in Royal Center. Yeah. I was kind of in, in the pit there. I, I was a little surprised by that. Um, but, again, Winnemac can be kind of testy with their defense because, uh, again, Winnemac can do a whole bunch of things because they're – I think Winnemac's best defense is that 3-2 zone that they play, but they can do more than just that. It just seemed like buckets were hard to come by for, for Pioneer in this game. Oh, and by the way, they're in the cage. Oh, the the, the pits, the football the pits, field. the football field. <laughs> just just going off of Bing's, you know, tendency to name everything. It's... Okay, I was uh, I was thinking New Mexico. Yeah, yeah, true. The New Mexico, yeah. Lobos play in the pit. Yeah, the pit. Um, but in a lot of ways, that's been the big the big issue for Pioneer all year has been scoring. Uh, where do they get their points from, other than Drew McKeg? And can they get those points on a consistent basis? You know, kudos to Winnemac, too. I mean, you know, this was a big game for them, and obviously, you know, a conference game. and Hadn't, hadn't beaten Pioneer since 2019, yeah. so they, they weren't going to take the game lightly. Yeah. But, again, they just got off to a great start. It was, what, 24-6 to six at one point in the second quarter. And again, Winnemac ahead by a pretty healthy margin the entire fourth quarter. And again, the thing about what makes Winnemac tough to defend is they've just got a, a lot of different scores and a lot of different ways to score with John Malco, Will Malco. I know we've talked about Hines and uh, Potoff. Justin Potoff, I think, had a, had a pretty good game in this game as well. So I think that gave Pioneer's defense some some issues just because there's not one person you can even you can really focus on. Yeah. yeah. A tough loss, but then they bounce back on Saturday night and beat North White at home 45-40. Yeah. So, again, you look at Pioneer, they're 8-12, and but they're 4-1 and one in the month of February. The only game they've lost this month was that Winnemac game. Yeah. 
And so now they got Tri County at home tonight and West Central at home tomorrow night. Uh, we'll see again two one eight teams at home. Ch- certainly winnable games. Yeah, Tri County will be interesting because I've seen mm-hmm. them play. They're they're quick mm-hmm. and they're physical. So it'll be a matter of uh, can Pioneer slow that Tri County team down a little bit and. You know, there's a, a real good uh, Zarcy, Sarah Zarcy, that plays on the girls' team while her brother plays on the boys' team, mm-hmm. and he's pretty darn good as well. Mm-hmm. So that'll be uh, that'll be interesting there, and uh, we'll see. You know, it's uh, I believe tonight is senior night for the Panthers, so they're going to do that tonight, and then they have the uh, final game. Hopefully uh, they can pick up a win as they go into to sectional play. They got the first round by, so they don't play until uh, Friday. They play the winner of uh, Wabash and Rochester, so. You know, could it be a Rochester Pioneer matchup there on Friday? Right. Again, what scares me about Pioneer is their free throw shooting. What I like about Pioneer is their ball handling with mm-hmm. McKeg and Rands, and uh, they should. I'm not too worried about just an avalanche of turnovers. Yeah. All right. Uh, Tippecanoe Valley setting at 14 and eight. Uh, Friday they went to Lebanon. That was an add-on game. Uh, 46-33 win at Lebanon. That's a good win for them. They went down and uh, faced uh, Flory and the Kokomo Wildcats on Saturday. Came up on the short end of that. That was a great atmosphere down there. I mean, just yeah. He, every gym that he goes to this year, it's full. I mm-hmm. mean, there's there's no you know, especially at home. Uh, Kokomo wins that one, fifty nine forty seven, and then a, it was fifty nine thirty seven. Thirty seven. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, Warsaw on Tuesday goes to Valley and, and wins sixty two fifty. And then they uh, wrap things up tonight against South Bend, Washington. So another well, marquee player coming for yeah. the uh, Vikings. Yeah, and Stephen Reynolds. Nobody said playing Kokomo and Warsaw back to back was going to be easy. Yeah. Uh, t- I talked with my friend Brian Gaskins, who uh, basically goes to all the. Co- he's, he's the sports editor of the Kokomo band. Tribune, mm-hmm. and he's he was actually pretty impressed by Valley. Um, he said Valley really handled Kokomo's pressure well because it's a it's not just. Flory right. as a rim protector, but it's all the pressure their guards put on you. Right. And he, he, he was actually pretty impressed by Davis Cowan and how Davis handled the pressure. Ian Cooksey shot the ball really well. Riley Shepard's been shooting the ball really well. Riley had a really good shooting game against Warsaw the other night. Um, again, I asked about Stephen Acasi. He goes, well, nobody scores against Flory. <laughs> he goes, you can't. He goes, I'm not going to. You should not judge Stephen Acasi about the Kokomo game. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I, again, uh, and again, the Kokomo game was the second game of a back-to-back after playing at Lebanon the previous night. Right. So you got to have another long bus <clears throat> ride. And then the Warsaw game was the third game in five days. And Again, Warsaw, they're just so physical and so tough. That that's not a team you want to play your third game in five days off one day of practice. So, mm-hmm. But, again, these games are helping, helping build them, especially after North Miami and Knox. Those games, I don't think we're helping them. So now you've got these tougher 4A opponents and add South Bend Washington to the list. Right. It's going to be interesting to see what they do against Washington. Obviously, uh, you know, marquee, marquee player in, in uh, Reynolds coming in for the uh, Washington Panthers. So Right. Who I know is thought of as a Division One prospect. But, uh, again, Cooksey has been shooting the ball better of late. Mm. Shepard has been shooting the ball. And, again, when they shoot the ball well, that should lead more opportunities for Akasi. And it'll kind of loosen up the inside for a cast. And even Kyler Johnson. Yeah. Again, it's a Valley team. They're going to play no more than about seven at this point. So uh, we'll see how they go from here. And we'll we'll talk about uh, their sectional draw, you know, on the sectional show. But obviously they're hosting. Yeah. And you got to like their chances to be the uh, the ones that are cutting the nets down at the end of uh, next week. Yeah. I mean, so. again, certainly you should not be pessimistic about Valley right now. Yeah. All right, uh, last one, Winnemac Warriors setting 11-12. and 12. We talked about their win at Pioneer. We talked about their win at home versus Caston. They follow that up. Um, they lose by uh, 17 to DeMott Christian last night, 70-53. to 53. Not sure what to take out of that one, but that's a team that we've seen, you know, a few teams that we know that have beaten this DeMott Christian team. All right, Winnemac beat Pioneer by 21. Pioneer beat DeMott Christian. Yeah, a couple about a week ago. Culver beat C- him as well. Right? Culver beat Demont Christian yeah. also. Yeah, yeah. So I was a little bit uh, kind of miffed at the the score from that. Yeah, kind of trying to figure out what happened there. Yeah, I, I haven't seen a box score from that, but yeah. for Demont Christian to put seventy points on the board. Yeah, it's so a Winnemac team that's been playing pretty good defense of late. So right. again, it's that was and it was at Winnemac, and it was at Winnemac. It was yeah. a head scratcher. 
I'm scratching my head. Winamax has been kind of hard to figure out all year. They've yeah, they've had they, a few of those, haven't they? And that, yeah, I mean, because that win over Castle was a great win. Mm-hmm. And uh, you look at some of the teams that that Winamax has beaten. I mean, that Twin Lakes team they beat was that Twin Lakes team is having a heck of a year. Yeah, yeah. That win looks better and better, but they've yeah. had some some head scratching losses as well. Yeah. So. They will. Uh, they will be. And uh, like I said, we're going to talk about that here in a minute. But they will be yeah. down at uh, Lewis Cass. Right. I think John Malcolm has gone over the 800 point mark in his career. Yeah. Good. So. And you know, again, with with Potoff and with Hines, and with Bentel, they've just got a lot of per- perimeter scoring options. Yeah. All right. I think that's it. Anything else here? To talk about before we close it up. Rochester bowling team finished sixth. Boys bowling team finished sixth in the state. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, the top four made the step ladder finals. Yeah. yeah, congratulations, though. I mean, what a run to make it all the way down to the the state finals. Yeah. So that was at Anderson last Saturday. So, yeah, yeah great year. Kudos to Elkhart. They finished fourth. The top four made the step ladder. They had to beat three, two, and one, and they did it mm-hmm. to win state. Yeah. So kudos to Elkhart. Yeah. Evansville North won the girls' state championship. All right. Well, thanks as always for tuning in, and uh, we will be coming up from Rochester High School next with the Rochester Zebras and the McConaughey Braves on Channel 4. Thanks for tuning in, everybody.